spotlight shining bright Gonna have a grand new show tonight With glitz and glam on the marquee Perhaps a Tony nominee Stars beam brightly, see them glow Sell out nicely, SRO It's time to applaud the Broadway beat Stars beam brightly, see them glow in the footlights of a show Life is sweet on the world's most famous street Tickets, please Take a seat Cue the band And tap your feet To the rhythm of the Broadway beat The Broadway beat Broadway beat Hello, I'm Richard Ridge and welcome to Broadway Beat our behind-the-scenes look at the very best of what the New York Theatre has to offer. This week we dropped by Kleinfeld Bridal on West 20th Street, where they played host to a meet-and-greet the cast of the new Broadway-bound musical, A Catered Affair, which opens at the Walter Kerr Theatre on April 17th. With a book by four-time Tony Award winner Harvey Firestein and a beautiful score by John Bocchino, the musical welcomes back to Broadway Tony Award winner Faith Prince. We were treated to a musical number from the show, sung by the bride and groom-to-be, Leslie Kritzer and Matt Cavanaugh. But let's start things off at the Hammerstein Ballroom for the MCC Spring Gala entitled Miss Cast 2008. The evening featured performers singing songs from roles that they would never get cast in. Now in its 22nd season, MCC is one of New York's leading off-Broadway theater companies. We weren't allowed to videotape any of the show, but we caught up with many of the performers as they were getting ready to hit the stage. The evening's honorary chair was renowned actress Lynn Redgrave, who just finished up her run giving a tour de force performance in MCC's production of Grace. The United States is now run by born-again Christians, by people who act because they think their prayers are being answered. In America, in a presidential election, an actor who reads the Bible would almost certainly defeat a rocket scientist who does not. And that country is our world's policemen. And what are they currently in charge of policing? Islamism. Islamism is not the moderate, self-critical belief system my son preached for. Islamism is a creedal wave that calls for our own elimination. Every jihadi sees the need to eliminate all non-Muslims either by conversion or by execution. And the most extreme Islamists want to kill everyone on earth except the most extreme Islamists. Well, they're very supportive, you know. I mean, they've got no money. I hope they'll have loads of money after tonight. And yet they, they go out on a limb with plays. And Grace, I think, surprised everybody in that it just kept selling out and I think it was a controversial sort of play that might not have done you know but yet they put it on I don't think it was a foregone conclusion and it was a very important play and so and it's a beautiful play so it was just thrilling the whole thing was great now had you worked with Jeffrey Richards before I've known Jeffrey Richards since 1967 he was working for Alexander Cohen and I came and did my first Broadway show for Alexander Cohen uh, black comedy and then when I did Shakespeare for my father in 93 on Broadway, uh, Jeffrey was my press representative. And, um, you know, he has said, and he's a man of his word, that he's going to present my new one-woman show, Nightingale, in this next season, if we find a theater, obviously. But um, that's his intention, and Jeffrey's a man who gets things done. So, and... Uh, Actually, my apartment in New York is across the road from here, so we run into each other in the park with dogs. <laughs> well, I was in, I was, I'm an actor, and so I was on the street, and I was angry at the way actors were being treated. And so I decided, you know, 19th century actor manager to take things in hand, and Bernie was very much committed to uh, creating a theater company. And at that time, I was a member of Circle Rep, and I did not want to create a nonprofit theater company. So we created a for-profit theater company. And we, uh, the idea behind it was to work in the studio with artists, create a script, and sell it to producers. And then we'd live off the percentage on the option. Well, in fact, we did sell three options, and we didn't make any money. <laughs> so we had to go nonprofit. And, uh, and then the idea, as is now, was to find voices for the theater, find artists, and give them support, whether it be uh, actors, directors, or playwrights. And uh, as we've grown in the last 20 years, 
we don't have the 50 actors anymore, the 10 playwrights and the 10 directors. We more or less hire the, the, the career, the talent pool that's here in New York. But we're still doing new plays. We're still doing a youth theater company with high school kids. And we have a literary department with 22 writers that are writing plays for the stage. And so it's more expensive 20 years later. That's the one thing I can tell you honestly. And, it's, um, and I have a much better staff than I had 20 years ago. And I have much better real estate than I had 20 years ago. So, uh, but I, what's interesting is the passion still there. The enthusiasm for the theater. Bernie and, our, Bernie and myself and Will Cantler, our associate, director still have the passion to put on plays and we just closed grace which for us was the facsimile of what it is to be an mcc production a new writer uh, well-known actors doing a tremendous production by a well-known director it was terrific that's just selfish tom no it's, no, it's not it's not selfish yes it is that's the excuse that allows you to hold on to this absurd leap of faith you make no what i'm trying to do is to help people feel that it's fine to be thinking moderate self-critical and religious and they're not the most dangerous people in the world mom they're not the ones to lose sleep over if i provide cover i provide cover for that lot i don't provide cover for sexist homophobic, bigoted people who put bombs on planes. I did that when I was a lawyer. Yeah. But, but life, life is complicated. And even the most ardent atheist... I am not an okay, atheist. Okay, 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 you know what I mean. Even the most ardent naturalist yeah. has to admit that life is not straightforward. I am an enlightenment person and I'm religious. Uh, well, that's a contradiction in terms. Exactly, and that's what I am. I live with that. Uh, uh, so Miscast started seven years ago when my dear friend Scott Whitman, who's one of the co-writers of the Hairspray musical, I said, we need to do a benefit. We need to sort of up the ante at MCC. And uh, he said, you know, everyone does benefits and everybody performs songs, but, you know, let's do something different. And he came up with the idea and the conception of Miscast, which was originally to give performers a chance to sing songs that they would never, ever get to sing. You know, it's not what they do in their repertoire or their auditions. And then we just ran with it. I mean, you know, we all know performers. I cast a lot of the Broadway shows. And we just started asking people. And it was amazing to find out how the actors just sort of ran with this idea. Because it was like, you know, like Kristen Chenoweth said, oh, my God, I've always wanted to sing Effie's song, I Tell Her I'm Not Going. You know, I mean, I never get to do that. And to do it in front of public, you know, or Jane Krakowski last year sang Shadowlands from, you know, Lion King. And she was, you know, doing this sort of African tribal dance and... It was hysterical, or Lin-Manuel, uh, you know, said, oh, I want to do Amy's song from Stephen Seinheim. I'm never going to get cast in that, you know, and it's just been on and on. It goes on, you know, I mean, the list, it, it's amazing how much the actors, and what's nice, we've been doing this for seven years, and now actors are wanting to come back. You know, they do it, and then two years later, they're like, can I be in it? Can I be in it? So it's just wonderful. Uh, fun, fun, fun. I'm here to have fun. Uh, Bernie Telsey asked me to do this. He said I would be singing with some great guys, Stephen Pasquale and Brian Darcy James, and singing things that I would never sing in my life and being ridiculous. And that's, I, I needed a little break from things. I wanted to just come out and be wild. Now, this is the first time you've done the Miss Cast benefit for MCC? That's right, yeah. Um, last year, a bunch of friends did it, but I think I was doing something else. And um, I got excited when, I, when he asked me to do it this year. This is for afterwards, anyway. So what are you doing tonight? Tonight, <laughs> tonight I am dressing in the full Christmas Santa gear and doing Today for You from Rent, Angel Song from Rent, which obviously I'd never be cast in. And um, with Stephen Pasquale and Brian Darcy James, I am singing Totally Fucked from Spring Awakening. <laughs> it's great because it lets you get a chance to step out of your normal zone and do something totally crazy. Right, and I especially feel with my conservative dress and my short little mom haircut that t singing Totally Fucked is going to be great. <laughs> Let's talk about MCC. I mean, this is the, the big gala that raises all of this money for this great theater company. What do you know about MCC? Well, I know that they're a, a, it's a wonderful company that does a lot of new works. Uh, they, they just finished Grace, which was a great play with Lynn Redgrave. And um, I, they're having great success, actually, getting new voices out there. And I think that's very, very important. And um, it's just going to go up from here. I think, I think there needs to be more of that going on. So, it gives me great pleasure to present to you MCC Theater's Miscast, Class of 2008. Please welcome to the stage.
The new musical, A Catered Affair, directed by Tony Award winner John Doyle, opens on Broadway at the Walter Kerr Theater on April 17th. With a book by four-time Tony Award winner Harvey Firestein and a gorgeous score by John Bocchino, the musical tells the story of a Bronx mother's efforts to give her only daughter the elaborate wedding that she never had and that the bride never asked for. Harvey Firestein leads a dream cast led by Tom Wopat, Leslie Kritzer, Matt Cavanaugh, and Tony Award winner Faith Prince. Kleinfeld Bridal on West 20th Street played host to a meet and greet where we were treated with a musical number from the show sung by the bride and groom to be, Miss Kritzer and Mr. Cavanaugh, accompanied by Mr. Bocchino. I never heard them say the way they feel. As things progress, will we feel nothing? They never use those words that make love real. They won't go near the words as though they fear the words. But me, I must confess, I need to hear the words. To do, I suppose to do with my own family. Uh, Harvey sent me the script. I got some way into it. I really liked how it was written. I mean, he writes very, very beautifully and with great care and humanity. Um, but the, the people who are in it are working class, ordinary, poor people. Very much the, where I came from. It's set in the 1950s. That's when I was brought up. I, you know, it's about a strong. You could say quite tough woman. You could call it. Um, who self-protects and, and shuts out the world rather than open herself in a vulnerable way. I recognize that in my family. Uh, I have, you know, a lot of Scottish strong women who, who have had to struggle and uh, let go of their own, um, uh, disguise their own emotional center. Um, and that's part and parcel of very much why I've gone into the theater, to try to tell stories about people like that, because I'm a great believer in that, that that we only have ourselves. You know, you, you can't be somebody else. I can't be another director. I can only be me. You can only do the story you think is the story worth telling from your own humanity and your own viewpoint. And this piece is all about humanity. Um, that's what's, it's, it's in a way sad to say that that's what's special about it, because I think that's what should be special about all theater, but it isn't always, you know? And so if you can do something that may just touch people in a way that you would like your own family to be touched, that's, that's very precious and very special. Um, now, that's not to say it isn't funny. It is funny, you know? It's, it's, but it's funny out of a reality and out of real situations rather than let's come on and tell a series of gags or, okay, we got you to a serious place there, now we'll do a dance, or, you know, it doesn't have that structure. It's, it's, uh, it's almost more like a beautifully crafted play with wonderful songs that the, that the uh, characters sing to tell us stuff that they couldn't otherwise tell us. But the whole thing's been so joyful. The whole, you know, you bring in the actors, and the actors have, have so easily taken over these roles. Between you and me, nobody's listening. Between you and me, you know, when you have a show with a breakout performance, it's unbelievable. With a break, you got three in the show. You got Faith Prince playing a role she was born to play, and nobody's seen her do anything like this. No matter what you've seen her do, she's never done a role like this. Tom Wopat, do you realize, has never created a role on Broadway? He's only done revivals. 
He's never created a role, so you're going to see Tom Wopat doing something he's never done before. And then Kritzer, everyone thinks of her as, you know, the funny girl who does, uh, you know, who's, who, who stole Legally Blonde in the chorus, you know, and who, you know, all this stuff, the, the great dancer, funny girl and all that. And she's just heartbreaking in this. So we've got, th- I mean, and not to take anything away from anybody else's performance, even that fire scene's pretty good, but... Um, but we have three real breakout performances in this. It's it's so much fun to watch that, and so much fun for me to know, um, to stand back and look, and, and know what's what the audience is going to be in for. It's great. You know, I used to have the feeling when we did Hairspray, um, when Hairspray first opened, uh, and people would say to me, "How do you get all that energy up to just do that every night?" And I said, "Because I know." what you're going to have, you and the audience. You're going to be screaming and jumping and waving your hands and carrying on. So that gives us, well, this one is very different. I know, but it's, but, but the same at the same time, I know what that audience is going to be feeling. I know the, re, the, the reaction they're going to have, the emotional thing they're going to go through, and the joy, the inner joy that this story tells. I know what it's going to do to the audience, and, and so I get to watch that and watch these breakout performances. It's heaven for me. Let's talk about the role you play. Well, I, 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 I wrote myself a cute role. Yeah. And I Faith Prince's role. I'd be really good in that role. I'd be really good in that role. But um, my mother actually said, my mother, I said, I'm doing Katie Fish. She said, you're going to play the mother? I said, no, I'm not going to play the mother. I'm going to play the uncle. Oh. <laughs> Isn't the mother the lead role? Yeah, I'm playing the uncle. Even my mother wanted me to play. No, um, yeah, I wrote myself. I, I mean, Barry Fitzgerald is unbelievable. I mean, he's unbelievable. So I didn't even try. I didn't. I just took that and tossed that out and wrote a different character because nobody's going to touch Barry Fitzgerald in anything he does. That man could fart, and I would sit and watch it on DVD for the rest of my life. He's just such genius. Um, so I wrote in the original Chayefsky piece, in the in the in the Gore Vidal adaptation he had a girlfriend and all that. But in the original Chayefsky, he was just a what we call a bachelor uncle, confirmed bachelor uncle. We all know what that is now. And and I saw an opportunity to, to tell a story that's never been told before of what it's what it must have been like for gays back then to sort of be invisible. And nobody you know, people knew, everybody knows, but nobody would ever you wouldn't talk about it. He doesn't even see there's a possibility to be in a relationship. And yet it's right there in front of him. So so there's something I saw some wonderful stuff to play with and and, uh, and it actually is the device that tells the story. He's mm-hmm. the show opens with him. I mean the audience doesn't know this, but the show opens with him in a suitcase in his hand and he's moving in with his boyfriend. And then the whole thing is a flashback in his mind and the show ends with him moving in with the boyfriend and um you know, taking this momentous step. We're doing a sage benefit, in fact, um, where we're invi- where we're going to have a panel of guys that have lived through this period are going to ex- sit on stage and have a talk back and talk about what it was like to be gay in 1953, which will be a lot of fun for me. Well, initially I was too scared, and Harvey says, you know, he tends to, he, he says, and I, I uh, wish he wouldn't, that, you know, when he asked me to do it, I said, I don't like theater. It was really more, I'm afraid of theater, and I said no initially, or was really tentative about it because I'm I have no ex, you know experience in this world, and to be diving into it at such a high level, at such a high profile with such high profile people, terrified me, and I kind of had to be talked into it, you know, more from from a, from a point of self doubt, like not knowing if I could really pull it off. But when you're sort of the new kid, to be surrounded by such amazingly talented and experienced people is the greatest gift you know you could ever ask for. So I feel um, very lucky. And well, let's talk about the collaboration. I mean, collaborations are so delicate. Yeah. This worked so beautifully. It, was, it wasn't that. Yes, with Harvey, um, he wrote the he wrote the he adapted the the book, and then uh, said, "Read it. You know, I'll look it over." Think of where you would like to, uh, where you think songs should go, and I'll make a list of where I think songs should go. We'll get together and have dinner and compare our lists. And they were virtually identical, which was a really good sign, you know, to start a, a collaboration with somebody. We were really on the same wavelength. And then for the next 
number of months, it was really just about taking each of those moments in the arc, you know, dramatic arc that he created, taking each of those moments in that were in his prose and morphing them into songs that, that achieve the same motion, uh, told the same story, and hopefully illuminated the emotions uh, and inner life of the characters a little bit more. That's all it was. Uh, the role is great. You know, Ralph is um, he's in love with Janie. He, he, he wants to get married. You know, they're, they're in similar situations in the sense that, you know, they're young adults who are ready to go out and start their own lives and sort of get out from under their parents' uh, grip. Uh, Ralph's station in life is uh, a little bit different than Janie's in that he's had a more middle-class upbringing. He is uh, more educated. Uh, I, I don't necessarily mean that he's smarter than Janie. It's just that he had the opportunity to go to college. You know, he's a teacher and whatnot. So, um, but he's also wants to break free from his mother's and parents, uh, mother and father's. You know, uh, you know, domain. He wants to get, you know, get on his own and uh, have him and Janie have their own life. I mean, it's so honest. You know, you know when you're when you're planning to get married and spending your rest of your life, hopefully spending your rest of your life with someone. You know, you don't, you want to know that it's going to work out. You want to know that, you know, you'll be with this person forever and this is the one. And you really don't know. You really don't know. Um, so how do you keep it alive? How do you keep it, especially if you're coming from a family that maybe it's not so loving and your parents don't say I love you all the time and it's, you don't want that. You want a loving, different relationship. Um, you, those questions in your mind are, you know, they're so real. And this song just hit me. You know, it's like, you know, don't ever stop saying I love you. Let's promise each other that we'll keep talking and we'll keep this alive. You know, and it's just, I mean, when I heard it, I was like, wow, this is so real. I totally can relate to this. And I think a lot of people can too. I mean, if it, even if you're not engaged or getting to marry, you know, just being in love with someone and the risk you take, you know, you know, of your heart being broken or it not working out, you know. Well, for me, doing a show like this is always kind of, a, it's overcoming some things because my basic instinct is to do a show where I do all the work. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I like being kind of, you know, the alpha male in a piece. And I am in this, but he doesn't really have much to say. He doesn't have much to sing. But then once he does, I mean, it's kind of, you can't ignore it, that's for sure. He's got something definite to say, and it, and it comes at a critical juncture of the piece. Um, what I'd like to say is that I, I, I like to drive the train, you know, like when I'm doing um, City of Angels or 42nd Street, you know, I'm, I'm driving the train. I'm the guy who kind of makes everything run. In this case, I'm the guy who stops the train. Yeah, the whole thing just comes to a screeching halt when uh, I finally say my piece. And it's... Um, uh, I think it's a very valid piece. It's got a lot to say, and I think it does it in a very unique way. Well, she's interesting. I think at first glance, you think slightly cold. You think uh, sort of cut off from her emotions. You can see that she's been a selfless kind of person, done for people. I mean, cooks, cleans, basically takes care of her family. And then, then you start to understand why she's cold, why she's cut off and we start on that journey and as in life things are never one or two it's usually three or four things that sort of come together to make high drama and it sort of reveals itself what this woman has sort of been sitting on top of for many years and I would say the mostly that she doesn't feel she's been loved and even though she's been living with the same man for 30, 40 years, you know. Um, and as all great theater, I mean, something wonderful comes out of it. So I think when people walk out, they think, A, oh, my God, this is my family, like John Doyle was saying. Uh, it's universal. You can relate to it. It's your aunt. It's your, it could be your uncle. It could be uh, your grandmother. In my case, I'm playing both my grandmothers. And um, and I, I wear my one grandmother's wedding ring and I wear the other one's earrings on stage because those are my women. I mean, I, that's that's how I'm able to see this character, where the love that I got from those women and the things that I innately felt as a child that they had gone through, you know. Um, 
and I think there's a lot of hope. People walk out. I mean, you're definitely you're never you're not going to be the same once you've seen this show, which I think that's what great theater should do. You know, you're just listening to you talk about it, and the same thing happens when I heard John talk about it. And Harvey, it's like it just cracks your heart immediately. Yeah, it does. It's honest. Without and seeing it. I know. I, I and believe me, and that's why I can't wait for you to see it. You gotta come. How challenging is she to play? It, the yeah. emotions you go through in this. Talk about it. It's well. Um, when we started, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna do this eight times a week. But you know, the more you get into it, the actually easier it is to just kind of go there. And I feel like you know everybody's got their special gift in life. God has blessed me with this one, and so. It's just what I need to do. And talk about the great score. Oh, his, well, his material, I mean, you heard today. It just, I, I, I was at Barbara Cook's opening the other night, and she did a number of his. It stops the room. It's, uh, it's, there's such incredible depth in that man. Um, and musical, and, and humor. I mean, it, all the pieces are are different um, and have a different flavor, but uh, it's a beautiful score. Haunting is the word I would sort of come up with. Never stop saying I love you. It's easy to say. It's easy to say. 